listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Damn right, we're delivered by DoorDash. Promo code BJNPODDD gets you 25% off and no delivery fees on your first order. Tyler Uremchuk and Cam Lewis here to break down a sweep. It's a long weekend and we are talking about the Blue Jays winning three straight baseball games. Feel, feels good, Coomsey. It does feel good. This is kind of what we've wanted to see them do throughout the whole time. You know, they started this nice little stretch against Anaheim, against Chicago and against Pittsburgh, and it started off poorly, but thankfully it ended well. They sweep the pirates and all told go five and four on this stretch. It would have been really, really upsetting had they not gone over 500, five and four. Isn't amazing here. We wanted to see like eight and one, seven and two, but the vibes are good. Now you can't complain about a sweep. Can't complain. It could have been worse. And yeah, you can't complain about a sweep. I think, you know, we can talk about exactly how they got that sweep and we'll certainly break into that or break that down over the course of today's podcast. Um, So let's get into it. It's three up, three down brought to you by our friends over at DoorDash. And let's go back to the first game of this three game sweep for the Toronto Blue Jays. And it was Alec Manoa who really set the tone for this ball club with the way he pitched in that opener. Um, First off for him personally, that must have been just awesome. You talk about the West Virginia connection and the amount of friends and family he had in the stands and everything he was doing leading up to that game. And he goes out, pitches into the eighth inning doesn't allow an earned run strikes out six just kind of ho-hum Manoa stuff right you're you're the ace of a staff or close to the ace of a staff and he goes out and delivers like he's in that role I no complaints about Manoa's start because he like I said set the tone for this series yeah, that was fantastic. That's what the Jays absolutely needed right off the hop going into Pittsburgh. We know the bats have been kind of cold recently, so they needed their starting pitcher to come in and start the series with a great outing. And that's what Alec Manoa did. To be totally honest, I kind of wish that John Schneider just let him go. Yeah. I would have liked to see him just have the chance to do a nine game or a nine and incomplete game shutout. It just seems like that's not really something that happens anymore in baseball. And there's already been, you know, a whole bunch of talk about Manoa and in his innings. So I totally understand why he didn't get that chance, but it would have been sick to see him get to do it. Right. Like, were you feeling that way when you're watching the game too? Yeah. And there was like that buzz on Twitter too. And it was kind of like, you know, no one's done it yet this year for the Jays. It would be cool, especially because like I said, that game had emotional yeah. value for Alec Manoa. Right. And you get the sense that when there's that extra little bit on the line in terms of his emotions, he maybe would have been able to crank it up a notch for another inning in a little bit. But at the same time, we've talked about this on the podcast before. We need to be wary about his his bullets, right? He only has so many bullets. He's a young pitcher. He's never pitched this much in a season. And if yanking him after facing 27 batters and throwing 98 pitches helps give him a little bit more oomph later in September, in October as well, when you're hoping he's throwing in playoff games, then that's just what you do. In the moment, I would have loved it. Big picture wise, now that it's been a couple of days, I, I kind of said that I go, yeah, okay, right move. Get him out, keep him around his pitch count and, and let's move on. Yeah, that's the correct logic. I, I I definitely do wrap my head around that. But if there was one thing for certain about this weekend, I think we all kind of expected Alec Manoa to dominate the Pittsburgh Pirates. That was one where it's here's a dominant right handed pitcher. Here's a lineup who can't really hit anybody, but specifically can't hit right handed pitching. As you pointed out in the last pod, Manoa came in, dominated as we expected him to. And pretty much just set the tempo for the entire weekend. It was also a pretty important dominant performance because it took a while for the bats to get going in that one. Yeah, it did take a bit for the bats to get going. They ultimately win for nothing, but you know, it wasn't exactly the quickest start for the Toronto Blue Jays in that baseball game. They scored two in the fourth and then it wasn't again until the ninth when they tacked on another couple it was a big Bo Bichette home run, though, that gets them those home or that gets them those runs. And that ties us into our second up. Bo Bichette in this series seemed to have turned around his season over a matter of a couple of games because he was tremendous. Yeah, no, 100 percent. That was the perfect transition was I saw quite a bit on Twitter uh, during and after the second game that in the top of the seventh, when Bo Bichette came up with the bases loaded, he put together not just the best at bat of his season but of anybody on the Toronto Blue Jays this year. And I think that's accurate. I mean, the amount of pitches that Bo was just fouling off and fouling off and fouling off until finally, I think it was the 10th or the 11th pitch of the at-bat. He just rips out into the outfield, scores three runs, just 
huge game changer for the Jays because so many times we've seen Bo and multiple other guys in the team come into a situation like that. And it's, you know, quickly like taking strike one and then swinging through something, swinging at a pitch outside of the zone, getting themselves not into a hitter's count and then striking out. I mean, we saw it multiple times during like this series against the pirates, a team with pretty shitty pitching. We saw them just kind of squander opportunities. So it was so cathartic to have Bo, especially Bo, a guy who's been so up and down and it's been such a difficult season for him. And he's really caught the ire of the fans. He's really been someone who I think fans have liked to kind of pin yeah. the frustrations of the season on. It's nice to see Bo come through in such a key moment. Yeah. The, the video of him kind of banging his chest while he's standing at second after that big of a hit. And, you know, you would have liked for the wins against the pirates. And we'll touch on this in a second you would have liked for them to not need like a bunch of clutch hitting to beat the pirates, but at least they got it right. And the vibes, the the table is set now heading into a series against Baltimore and a big, big double header tomorrow. And for Bo, you know, this was talked about a little bit on Twitter. If any player has a chance to really set the tone down the stretch here, it, it might be Bo. Like as much as we talk about Vladdy and you know how this season maybe hasn't lived up to the hype that you were or lived up to what he did last year. With Bo specifically, if he can get back to a guy you can trust in the two spot or the three spot or even the four spot, and he starts getting on a bit of a run here, and that, because we talked about this on the last pod, Coombsy, he seems to be a guy who carries his bat with him out into the field, right? When he's struggling at the plate, I think you see his defense struggle a little bit as well. Okay, well, if he's getting hot at the plate and he gets hot with the glove at short, this is a guy who has the chance to be... Maybe at the end of September, this is the best way for me to sum up my thoughts. We're talking about Bo Bichette as the MVP of the Jays this month. Sure. That's, that'd be fantastic to see because, you know, like I said, he's been kind of the guy that everyone's made the poster child for their, their struggles. And what they see with Bo is a guy that comes up and sometimes has uncompetitive at bats. He comes up and swings through a few pitches and two seconds into the at bat, he's 0 two. So seeing him as the games get more difficult and the demand for clutch plays and big plays gets higher, seeing Bo kind of respond to that would make us forget about yep. most of what happened this year. Right. I say that with Jose Bar Rios all the time. I mean, if he has a huge September, gets the Jays into the playoffs and then wins a start in the wildcard round or something like that, it's pretty easy to go and say, hey, you know what? I don't remember that he allowed eight runs to the Milwaukee Brewers that time in July. You just kind of forget about it. So hopefully this is Bo turning it around. The games mean a lot more right now. And maybe he's just going to play up to the level. Yeah, I mean, you're certainly hoping so, right? Because that was a great series. Uh, we'll get to a few more things when we get to the down part of this. But um, I loved the tweet from our Jays Nation Twitter. Jordan Romano nails, man. Like those last two games there for him to step in and pick up a big, big pair of saves. And then also in this last one to do it the way he did, right? You give up a couple of hits. You're sitting there being like, okay, hey, let's get ready for extra innings here because it's second and third none out. And Romano just bang, bang, bang. He's proving to be one of the premier closers in baseball. Yeah, we say that's almost every single time yeah. we talk about Jordan Romano. We're like, you know what? Yes, we have to put this guy into the conversation for elite closer. He's not just, wow, here's some guy from the Blue Jays system who happened to fill into the role anymore. No, he's one of the best out there. And he picks up his 30th save of the season after having a guy on second and third with some like bullshit, scrubby Babbitt bad luck. Yeah. And then he goes and strikes the last two guys out. I will say though, I feel like the Jays got, and I, I followed up on the tweet with this. I feel like the Jays got some divine intervention on behalf of Pittsburgh's manager. Cause it really felt very 2022 blue Jays for Tyler Heineman to come up and hit like a shitty bloop walk-off single in that yeah. situation. But Pittsburgh pinch hit for a right-handed batter for whatever reason, Romano strikes him out. And I was just like, I, I had already visualized in my head and I hate being this negative because they swept, but this is just a negative intrusive thought I had in the ninth inning. I was like, there's no doubt that the blue Jays DFA would fourth, fifth, whatever string catcher he was comes back to bite them at the beginning of September. That would just be so 2022 Jays, but thank fuck it didn't happen. Thank fuck that. Um, Pittsburgh's manager decided, you know what? No, we're not going to put blue Jays fans through that. And Romano got a fantastic moment out of it. Yeah. Uh, just looking at some basic stats here over at uh, MLB.com. Jordan Romano now tied for second in the majors in saves with 30. And of the guys who are either first, Kenley Jansen has 31 or 
tied for second. It's Jansen Hader, Rogers, and Emmanuel Klaas from uh, the Cleveland Guardians. Romano is the second best ERA of all those pitchers as well. You have Jansen at 3.75, Josh Hader's all the way up to 6.35, which is a remarkable storyline. A guy who is yeah. one of the best relievers in all of baseball goes from Milwaukee to San Diego and has not just been junk. He's been borderline unplayable for the San he's Diego. Off a cliff. It's just fallen off a cliff. It again goes to show this will circle back to like conversations we've had around the deadline. You cannot predict relievers. You can Never. sit there and think you're getting Josh Hader and Josh Hader turns into a pumpkin the second he joins your organization. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it really seemed like the surest sure bet you could make if you're San Diego. Yeah. You're like, we, we need like a lockdown guy. And here's a guy who's done it for so long and his stuff is so good. And he just turns into a pumpkin. It's nuts. But that's relievers. Uh, Taylor Rogers is at a 4.19 ERA. So again, like you talk about guys who rack up a ton of saves and who also keep their ERAs low and don't have these big blow up moments. Jordan Romano is in the A tier of all of that because he's just been so good. Um, and again, Josh Hader, 1.1 innings pitched, six earned runs over the last seven days. It's insane. That's, that's we, sh- we should also point out how good the other relievers were for because that was like a huge up throughout the entire yeah. series, especially in game two. You looked at, okay, Trevor Richards is starting this thing and then it's going to be some combination of Yusei Kikuchi and maybe Casey Lawrence. And they hold the Pirates to one run. They strike and they pick up 13 strikeouts. I mean, the Pirates sure as fuck aren't like an elite offense by any stretch of the imagination, but the fact that you can toss out like a Trevor Richards, Yusei Kikuchi, and then you have Jimmy Garcia come in when there's runners on to kind of get, it wasn't really it wasn't technically the save, but it kind of was the save there in the middle of the game. You have that happen. That's like a, that's a good vibe because I feel like we joked about the idea of, okay, you say Kikuchi spot start, that's going to be a mess, but they put it together. Yeah. And like even the Kikuchi one, that, that game, if they would have lost it seven, five or something, we would have been like, what did you expect? Right. You tinker with the rotation. You want to line things up perfectly for this series coming up against Baltimore and it bit you in the ass. You shouldn't have given up what we would have viewed as a free win against Pittsburgh, but credit to him. Like even though Kikuchi kind of gave up four hits and whatever, he only gave up one earned run. Like it didn't hurt you. It's kind of one of those where, you know, I certainly do not hope they're planning a, a lot more Richards Kikuchi bullpen days, but you did it once and you got away with it. And I give John Schneider and company credit for pulling yeah. it off this one time and getting away with it. It was gutsy. It was a huge risk. Like you said, they, we would have been fucking livid if they had lost that second game. We're like, oh, no, you can't sweep the Pirates because he went out there and did that. But man, Trevor Richards has been really good recently. And Kikuchi, as soon as they saw there were struggles, they're like, all right, we're going to pull the trigger. And you basically have a fifth, sixth inning Jimmy Garcia save situation. And that's the way it is. But I think this experiment worked and it proved that when the schedule gets hard and your starters are tired, you can give them an off day because there is another doubleheader coming up after this Baltimore one. You can yeah. give them an off day uh, with this combination. It worked. So why not do it again? <laughs> oh, dude, are you <laughs> flying too close to the sun though? Uh, yeah. I like, I like the point you made about Trevor Richards in his last seven games. He's thrown seven and a third, only allowing four hits, not allowing a single earned run. Trevor Richards, basically him finding his form is almost like another Deadline it acquisition, it's right? A deadline acquisition. Anybody who's playing shitty who pulls it together <laughs> is a trade deadline acquisition. So we're going to say that they went out and got a brand new Trevor Richards because that's pretty much what it was. People yeah. were wanting this guy DFA in June, and now I don't know. I'm I'm not uncomfortable with him pitching in a high leverage spot at all. No, and and especially because too, it's not like he's it's not like he's a young guy who you know early in the season struggled, but they held on to and is now figuring it out. Trevor Richards at least has a track record of being a pitcher who you could rely on as race in his last season. So I'm with you 100%, man. Like if if you need to go to Richards in a high leverage spot, I'm not sitting there and screaming at my TV being like, what are you thinking? Why are you throwing this game away? Like he can clearly handle it to some extent. Yeah, Richards, uh, Richards Kikuchi, that's going to be the new... Uh, their new sixth starter. We're, we're, we're feeling comfortable with it. We're, we're riding the wave here. It was three wins against the Pittsburgh pirates. And we're feeling good about that. Uh, but let's get into the downside of things. I'll start with the first one. Coombsy. Okay. Three wins against Pittsburgh. I am not going to complain about sweeping a series, but 
all three of those wins were relatively stressful wins. And again, if you want to be a, if you want to be considered a World Series contender, if you want me to believe in you as a World Series contender, and I'm sure I speak for a large portion of the fan base when I say this, you probably could have handled the Pirates a little bit easier than that, right? Yeah, uh, <laughs> no, you 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 hit the hit the nail on the head there. The Jays only scored four runs in all of those games. I don't think you necessarily go into a series against Pittsburgh and think, you know what, we're going to put up twelve runs. I think you go into a series against Pittsburgh and hope that you're going to blow the doors off of it at least yeah. once and put up ten runs or something like that. I mean, that's what you would have liked to have seen. Uh, there's positives to be gained from the bats throughout the series. Like we said, with Boba Shets at bat in the second game, fouls off a ton of pitches, fantastic stuff, some other clutch hits as well. But it was far from the offensive performance that we would have wanted to see against the Pirates. It doesn't, you would have liked to have seen them come in there and kick the doors off of them at least once, but such is life, I guess. Yeah, and it, and it seems like a petty thing to kind of complain about again after a series they swept. But you're right. They scored 12 runs in that series, exactly four per game. But each game, you more or less needed a clutch hit at some point or a clutch either start or big relief appearance from someone. And I just sit there and go, ah, I would have liked like today. We're probably feeling yeah. a little bit better if they win this game 8-1, right? And it's like, ah, the bullpen got a rest day. Romano didn't have to go like all this stuff. You had to use your stud closer in two of the three games to beat the Pittsburgh Pirates. That's not exactly ideal. No, that's kind of the that's that's the other shitty thing. And that's the thing I had written down as my down from this series was they couldn't come into that third game after using Romano on Saturday and say, all right, let's kick these pitchers around, kick these scrubs around, score a whole bunch of runs. So, you know. You get six innings from Ross Stripling and then we can hand it off to, I don't know, Casey Lawrence or somebody else who just needs to get some work in. And just then we go in Baltimore on Monday, well rested, because now it's kind of like things were tight. The offense didn't explode in game three like we would have liked and things were tight. So you had to use Romano two games in a row and now you're going into a double header against Baltimore. And it's like, can you use Romano three days in a row? If you're in a tight situation in the first game, I guess it's Jimmy Garcia. I don't, I don't know how you go back to Romano again that quickly. Well, and especially that, like if you would have blown up the pirates in game three and your key relievers get a day off, you're going into a crucial double header against Baltimore where you're like, okay, our big guys are available. Like you said, you go Garcia game one, if you need them Romano game two. And now it's at the point where, you know, I'm sure Jordan Romano is not going to scoff if if you need him, but no. that's not exactly the most sustainable way way to run a bullpen. Granted, you had to get the win against Pittsburgh. You couldn't risk blowing that game and losing a big win. But now you're going into a series against Baltimore where you could argue things are almost worth double at that point, right? Because of you gain a game on Baltimore, they're losing a game on you at the same time. It's that two game swing kind of thing. And now you might not have Romano for either game. That's a lot more pressure on your starters to go deep. So again, it's petty, but you nailed it with the amount they had to use their bullpen. Like I said, specifically with the amount they had to use Romano and how tight these games were, they could have set themselves up a little bit better coming out of this series. Yeah, it is what it is, though. Yeah. It's, we're yeah, yeah. kind of we're kind of digging for negatives we now are. a little bit, but but the overarching point that the both of us are trying to make was the reality is while they got the job done, at no point did that yeah. feel stress free, and we're not rolling into the upcoming series against Baltimore thinking, "Fuck yeah, we just swept the team." We're thinking, "Phew, we just swept the Pirates." Oof. Yeah, and that's actually a great way to put it right there is it's kind of wipe the sweat off the forehead and like, okay, we got through that. Now let's now let's hope the team can catch fire. Uh, My third down. Are you at all worried about Vladimir Guerrero Jr.? Because while Bo Bichette woke up and all that stuff, he didn't have a very good series against a pretty poor Pirates team. And just watching his ABs when I got a chance to, there were game there. There were pitches he was missing that I'm sitting there going. Okay, that's like a sinker that's 84 and right down the middle at the bottom of the zone. Like usually he's crushing that thing. He's clearly not at the level he was last year. I said that earlier, but he's not heating up and I'd love to see him pick things up right away. Yeah, no, you're, you're not wrong. I mean, I think Vladdy's had some quiet hot streaks this year. We haven't seen the loud bang that we saw from him last year where he was just so clearly so good and hitting so many home runs and was just unstoppable for periods of time. But now he's having quiet little hot streaks where he, you know, goes 
three for five with a walk multiple times in a week, that kind of thing. But there isn't just the same power that we saw from Vladdy last year. He doesn't feel like the same home run threat right now. Uh, He doesn't seem like the same threat when he's coming up with runners in scoring position last year, you'd come up, there'd be a guy on first and you'd be like, you know what, Vladdy could double this guy. And now it's kind of like, is he going to pass the baton? What's happening? There's so many balls on the ground. Is this going to be a double play? It's hard to say. I mean, it's, it's a weird thing because this was the conversation we had about Vladdy when he first came up is that he was drilling balls into the ground. And then last year he figured out how to elevate this year. It's been all over the grid up and down, but there's also been all this stuff with different balls, the dead ball, the weighted ball, the flying ball, blah, blah, blah. (laughs) So who knows, honestly, uh, it's been a weird season. I'm not, I don't think I want to just draw too many conclusions about anything right now. Yep, that's totally fair. I mean, there's also plenty of time for him, like you mentioned with Barrios, and like we talked about with Bichette. There's plenty of time for Guerrero to all of a sudden have us look back and go, that was a good year. Like, if he rattles off and bats (laughs) 375 for the rest of the regular season, then hits a big home run in the playoffs, we're not going to sit there and be like, oh, Vladdy wasn't as good as he was last year. We're going to be ecstatic. That guy's going to have statues built in front of the Rogers Center one day if, if he has a good playoff run. You know, like, it's just this time of year, your success can really elevate the rest of your season is kind of my point. 100%. Yeah. Uh, All right. So there's our three up, three down for the sweep of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Let's go around the American League where the Yankees and Rays, that was a big series. They went head to head. Uh, The Yankees lost two of three to the Tampa Bay Rays. The Mariners, uh, they were, you have them as in a- They're in a delay right now. Yeah. Yeah. They um, were playing when we started, but I haven't seen if they've come out of the delay just yet. Yeah, they were taking uh, on the Cleveland Guardians this weekend, and Seattle had rolled through the first two games. Seattle's won yeah. six in a row all of a sudden. So They're again, on fire. you talk about sweeping the Pittsburgh Pirates. Thank God they did, because Seattle, if you didn't take care of business against Pittsburgh, Seattle would have been miles ahead of you in the in the wild card race. Mm-hmm. Seattle now is 1.5 ahead, yeah. but they're in the delay right now against Cleveland. If they pull off the sweep, that would put them two games up. If they don't, then they would only be one game up of the Blue Jays. They are up two to one right now in the fourth inning of that ball game. So, uh, yeah, they're one and a half up. The Rays are one up on the Jays as well. And then you have the Yankees, who sit six games ahead of the Toronto Blue Jays. Again, it would take Toronto getting stupid hot, but you do still have three head to head games at the dome down the stretch. So maybe we don't write it off yet. Eh? Oh, it's 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 possible, man. The Yankees are hell bent on blowing this thing. It yeah. seems I really do think it'll be the Rays who catch them. Yeah, I kind of I kind of see it, but maybe I should have more optimism that it could be the Jays. Sure. Why not? Nine, Let's say they get hot and catch the Yankees. <laughs> nine games still between the Rays and Blue Jays down the stretch yes. this season. That's just that's going to be incredible uh, coming up for those teams. Tampa is taken on Boston at the trot and the Yankees are welcoming the Minnesota Twins on Monday. So so Interesting. not exactly a great break schedule wise for Toronto. Um, I, I know Minnesota. I shouldn't say that Minnesota right now, the way they're, they're playing. Fine. Yeah, they're very capable of beating this Yankees team because the Yankees, like you said, seem hell bent on blowing this. And the Rays, I mean, the Red Sox have won five in a row. They're seven and three in their last 10. So maybe maybe I'm just reading too much on the surface there. Maybe there is a chance that the Jays get a good break to start next week. But the key is really the head to head they are playing and that's against Baltimore and thanks to Baltimore losing their last game of their series against Oakland. They had won the previous two. They're now two and a half back of the Jays. So worst case scenario is the Jays get swept and they're only one and a half back. Or if they sweep Baltimore, they're then suddenly six and a half up on them, which is nice. We're going to step aside and then I'm going to yell at you for bringing up the potential of the Jays getting swept. All right. Our series preview, as always, is brought to you by our friends over at Points Bet Canada. The Jays open this thing up. It's a four gamer against Baltimore, but they open it up with a double header on Monday against the Orioles. That all gets going just after one o'clock Eastern time. You said if the Jays get swept, they're only going to be, what was it? Two and a half or one and a half back. I, either way, don't say shit like that, Coombsy. The Jays are not getting swept over the course of a four game series against the Orioles. Yes, they maybe don't have us feeling as good as they should right now. But coming off a sweep of the Pirates, the rotation should break a decent way for them here because of the maneuvering they did against Pittsburgh. They're getting at least the split here. I promise you that. I don't know. They So the maneuvering you're talking about is the whole point of doing that bullpen day on Saturday means that they can now do Kevin Gosman and Jose Barrios for the doubleheader, which is which is good. That's what you like. Mm-hmm. Um, but still, Baltimore is on fire, man. They're 
They're six and three against the Jays so far this year. And these are not the Orioles we expected to see come September. I vividly remember being on a preseason podcast with you and BK. And we were like, you know what? Hell yeah. They're going to get to finish off the season playing these easy little tune-up games against Baltimore. They score 70 runs. And now it's just like, oh man, they got to play these games against Baltimore. What the fuck? But at least there is a two, 2.5 game buffer here. The Jays, at the very least, have to roll in two Camden yards in this four-game series and pick up a sweep or pick up a split. That's the at the very least. The word sweep is in my mind now. I'm very anxious about it, as you can tell. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Split at the bare minimum here. If you're the Toronto Blue Jays, this Orioles team is not slowing down. They're still seven and three in their last ten somehow. But you know, let's send them down the wrong path here because if you can get their season spiraling with this four-game set. All of a sudden, the remaining six games against the Orioles after this suddenly feel a lot easier. So this is a pivotal, pivotal series for the Toronto Blue Jays. Like I said, I give a ton of credit to John Schneider and company for the way they maneuvered this pitching rotation. Mm -hmm. You have a doubleheader with Gosman and Barrios. Barrios, I know, up and down, roller coaster, all that shit. But you're going to need your guys to come through for you. So Gosman, Barrios in a doubleheader is huge. You end the series with a Manoa start. He's been fantastic. I'm feeling good. I'm cautiously optimistic. If they win this series and take three of four, Mm -hmm. I will be fully optimistic. But for right now, I'm still being a little bit, a little bit ho-hum and on the fence. I have big expectations. I'm calling it Coombsy. This is a big Vladdy Guerrero Jr. series coming. I'm I'm telling you, he's going to go to Camden. He's going to rake a couple of big home runs. He's going to have a few doubles. This is going to be when he turns things around, Bo will stay hot and the team will feed off that. I, I really do believe this is going to be the series things turn around. I echo your sentiments on Bo. Mm-hmm. That's who I think is going to be the guy carrying them offensively through the okay. series. I think it's going to be a low scoring series, yeah. which is a little surprising because games between Baltimore and Toronto have been fireworks in the yeah. past, but I think it's going to be a low scoring series. And I think we're going to see the Blue Jays pitchers shine. I think we're going to see a start from Jose Barrios this week that makes us forget about shitty starts from earlier in the season. Uh, but the, the, the pessimist in me, the one, no, the agent of chaos who always thinks fucked up things are going to happen is this series is going to kick off with former Oriole Kevin Gosman laying an egg. Weird feeling I have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm not going to let you think like that. Um, I'm debating editing it out of the podcast. So no one else hears you say it. Feel free. Feel free to edit out whatever, whatever things I've said. Uh, all right. It, it's a long weekend. So we're going along in the universe. It's a long weekend. So we're going to wrap this thing up a little bit earlier here. Uh, Coombsy, a pleasure as always. Shout out to our friends at DoorDash and Points Bet Canada. We'll chat again after a big, big four game against the Orioles. I'm going to, oh, I'm going to bring this up. John Gibbons followed me on Twitter the other day. Which yeah. is confusing for me because my Twitter bio really only advertises me as like a, a hockey guy. I'm going to DM him next week. You Maybe, should DM him right now. I know I'm too nervous. Say, hey, Gibby. What are you nervous about? He followed you. He thinks you're a cool guy. Yeah, that's fair. Believe in yourself. Yeah. I'll DM him next week. I promise yeah. you next week. We're going to try to get Gibby on the pod. No, I don't think it, it'll work. Get on but. it now. Do it now. Do it now. Maybe that'll Give be me a your bit. account credentials and I'll log in and message them for you. Maybe that'll be a bit on the next episode as I pen my DM to John Gibbons. We can work on it together. That'll be a good thing for us to do. That'll be good. Yes. Okay. All right. We will DM John Gibbons on the next episode. We'll of the podcast. do a one word. We'll do a, on the next episode. We'll do a one word story back and forth and you have to send that to him. That seems wildly unprofessional, that? but I might do it. All right. Coombsy. Sure. I think enjoy. it'd be funny. Enjoy your long weekend, buddy. We'll chat next week. Best wishes. Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.